But today, we're going to talk about urban agriculture. And um, I uh, tried to alphabetize it. I couldn't think of anything that started with Z, but maybe we can come up with something later. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to just go through a whole lot of pictures that I have uh, taken, most of them locally. And um, I thought that they would illustrate quite well what urban agriculture is to me, and uh, maybe inspire some discussion later. So I thought um, I would just divide it into a couple of parts. And the first one is um, why urban agriculture. Um, I think there are many reasons, and one of them is, of course, sustainability. Uh, this is a picture of Farmer Ray at the uh, Halliburton Farm. Uh, and the Halliburton Farm, like a lot of urban farms, does everything with manual or very small scale equipment labor. So um, I don't. I think it's a million miles away from the large-scale industrial farming practices that are so reliant on uh, fossil fuels and really, really big equipments that get you into really, really big debt. So uh, urban agriculture can help us remember what it is to be sustainable in our agriculture. It can help us build community. Um, another thing you'll hear me talking a lot about is the Gorge Telecom Urban Farmers. We live in the Gorge Telecom area, and we have a group that has been meeting for about five years now, I think, um, to talk about um, food security and how to grow stuff. Um, food security is, I think, a, a path to self sufficiency as well. Um, and urban agriculture can help with that. If you know how to grow things, you know how to feed yourself. Food literacy is a term I've been hearing a lot about lately, and I think urban agriculture can help children and adults to uh, regain some skills in food literacy. I think we've lost a lot of uh, knowledge in how to grow food, how to prepare food, and, and what it really means to us as, as cultural beings as well as how it will nurture us. Plant literacy as well, I think, is something we can learn a lot from urban agriculture. I've got some, uh, some garlic rust you can't see too well. There. And um, it's, it's, ever since I've started growing food in my backyard, I've learned so much about what things are. I, I delight particularly in rather obscure plants. The one in the middle is an Egyptian walking onion, just starting to walk. And um, the big mass on, mass on the bottom right corner is oka. Some of you may have come across that. And if you haven't, you should run up and get some. It's really fun. Um, and then nature literacy. These are my bees. They are blue orchard mason bees. Um, can anybody here tell which one is the male and which one is the female? Hmm. <laughs> right. It's the guy on the left. Yeah. Oh. It's, uh, they have mustaches. <laughs> <laughs> and the females have these choppers that they make the, um, their little mason uh, walls with. Um, other things I've uh, come across include um, the uh, tree frog up in the top left. That was at uh, Carolyn Harriet's garden. Um, I, however, am really good at cultivating other stuff like uh, ten caterpillars, which is the one on the top right. But I am very pleased to, to note that there are the little white spots on its forehead. That means it's um, it's been parasitized by the um, Krakenid wasp, I think it's called, which will. Um, it's undoing. It's actually about three there. So kind of the one on the bottom right is a bald face hornet, and it depends how you feel about bald face hornets. Uh, I actually think they're a really good idea, but not when they're at nose level on my apple tree. So unfortunately, I did watch it for a while, but I had to do away with the nest. And then the bottom left is it's a one-day-old hummingbird, <laughs> uh, which uh, very kindly hatched on my hands, so I was able to watch it all last spring, well, for two weeks. Um, urban agriculture also lets you uh, meet other people and compare notes. Um, it's a great way to learn things and to, of course, build community. Um, this, these are some of the George Hill of urban farmers um, on one of our garden tours. Um, I think urban agriculture is great for growing giant vegetables, as a farmer can suggest. And I, I think it's um, wonderful to see somebody who can grow such magnificent lettuce entirely organically and by hand. It's a marvel. Um, and then we 
think you just get to learn all kinds of new skills with urban agriculture. Um, some of these were taken at Halliburton Farm. The one on the top left is uh, dating calendula seeds. And in the middle, they're planting apple trees. On the right, that's Bob Duncan um, showing off their Horton um, method of creating a fruit tree. The bottom left is one of the Gorge Tillich urban farmer talks. We had a fellow come in and talk to us about how to propagate mushrooms. Um, one of our members is uh, showing us how to grate garlic on the bottom. And then we all do a lot of canning and drying and preserving. I think those are uh, great skills to learn from your own garden. And of course, urban agriculture teaches you seasonality because um, you get to see right up close what's growing. This is a basket of produce that one of the Gorge Hill urban farmers uh, brought to a meeting uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so he's still growing. I think he just pulled his last carrots and beets um, last week. Uh, I love food, so um, food things are pretty important to me. And, and being able to share food that you've grown is magnificent aspect of urban agriculture. And so is eating well. I <laughs> do as often as possible. So um, then we want to talk about what is urban agriculture because it means a lot of things. I think um, it gets tangled up in this notion of urban farming and it doesn't have to be so formal. But there are lots of different incarnations and um, I was able to find examples of most of those from around here. This is a, a farm. This is a Halliburton Community Organic Farm. And uh, it's one actually of five farming parcels on the property. And uh, it has uh, many things in common with, with larger farms. Um, but it, everything is kind of smaller scale. So you see the equipment is much smaller. And so are the greenhouses and, and the rows. Um, and the thing that really sets it apart, though, is it's got neighbors um, right behind it. And, looking at it. Um, so there are a lot of gardens, and I'm sure many of you have those or have seen them in the neighborhoods. And they um, bring in all kinds of other issues to do with uh, community, like uh, is everybody going to be able to use pesticides or nobody? Or what do you do if one of your um, people gets, one of the plants gets a, a disease that can spread to other plants? And how do you negotiate all that? Water is always a big issue with these community farms, too. Uh, this is one closer to here. It's on um, the Spring Ridge Common just up the road. This is taken a couple of years ago, so it looks a little more orderly than that. But at that time, it was struggling to find people to care for it. And um, I think that, that always is a bit of a struggle with community gardening of any kind. Um, it does take a lot of effort and energy by people and people with knowledge and, um, and time. Um, and then there are boulevard gardens. This is um, some of my neighbors uh, putting one in on my front yard. I'm right on Gorge Road, and it struck me that nobody there has a food garden in their front yard, so I thought I would do it. Um, I'm not sure that it's really looking that wonderful, but I, uh, I, did, I, I did actually have some strawberries up there last year, and, and I've got some sort of um, struggling raspberry bushes and things. But, uh, I think boulevard gardens are often more of a statement than a really productive area, but they can be both. Um, many of you will have heard of spin farms. That's small, small plot intensive farming. And that's uh, also known as backyard farming, grass farming, whatever you call This is one in uh, Fairfield. And as you'll see, it's got a lot of green stuff in the background. And um, I'm not sure if that's Leylandia or just a cedar hedge, but um, it brings to mind a point that preoccupies me quite a lot, um, which is uh, solar rights and, uh, and what kind of, uh, what, what methods we have of, of allowing people to grow food in cities, because if they have neighbors like these ones, I mean, what kind of relationship are you going to have with somebody with a hedge like that? They're obviously, um, wanting a bit more privacy than most people, and they don't really care what happens on the other side of the hedge. Um, so I think that's a bit worrying. In England, there are actually whole municipal departments just to deal with Leylandia Cypress, which is this kind of um, fast-growing, very thick hedge that can grow 200 feet easily. Um, there are crazy things in the city. 
but then so are really tall buildings. <laughs> then there are backyards. This is mine. Um, we all have our challenges. Uh, and uh, one of my challenges is that I'm surrounded by trees, so that's partly why I'm light obsessed. But I also have a great deal of concrete just where the light actually does fall. So I've struggled with various ways of trying to grow food. And uh, as you'll see, I use all kinds of different pots and planters. And, um, the little uh, purple edge you can see right here. That is a, um, a child's wading pool. It cost me $11 from the Canadian Tire. <laughs> I bought it about five years ago. I've got two of them, and uh, they're still going. So, uh, I actually have got raised beds as well, but I'm just going to keep growing stuff from those as long as they last. Um, if you are able to grow enough food to um, uh, sell it or share it, you can um, set up a farm stand, uh, but only if your bylaws will allow you to do it. This is uh, Deb Highway, who runs Donald Street Farm, which is a skin farm operation in the Gorge Telecom area, and she has a farm stand on her property on McDonald Street, and um, she's had to shut it down a couple of times because the neighbors have complained. Um, not the neighbors who shop there, probably. <laughs> but, um, so that's an ongoing battle, that kind of thing. Um, and then you can also have uh, CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, for vegetable boxes. This is one of the happy customers from Albert Farm. It's a great way of, of sharing the risks and rewards of farming. Um, the CSA subscribers pay in advance so that the farmers know that they have enough money to buy seeds and, and do the farming, and then somebody to share the risks with them when, um, when the harvest comes in or not, as the case may be. Um, you did have the talk on green roofs. I don't suppose the focus was purely on food production, but uh, I just thought I'd throw in a picture of the green roofs in Montreal because they have done a lot of food growing there. Um, there are a lot of issues around using roofs for, for growing food um, because if it's a commercial spot, then it becomes uh, sort of liability issues and um, weight distribution. How do you get all the water and the equipment up there? And what kind of traffic are you going to allow coming up and down? Bags of compost or uh, piles of vegetables. And then speaking of compost, um, I thought the one on the left was kind of charming. That's at the Compost Education Center. And it was a, uh, a kind of compost bin doubling as a potato tower. <coughs> the one on the right is a hot compost that we built when I was taking that kind of design course last year. And um, what we did there was we put some kind of scrap wood and leaves and stuff on the bottom and then we put some really smelly vegetable waste in the middle and then covered it in um, horse manure and compost uh, mulch and then planted um, squash on top. So I thought that was really cool that we could actually grow stuff while it was composting. And then over the course of the year, we can compost it out. And it's relatively road improved because um, it's really stinky vegetables and surrounded by stinky horse manures. Anybody know what those are? <coughs> uh, no. It's quinoa. <laughs> That's growing in Carolyn Harriet's garden, so just so you know, you can grow it here too. Once you have grown your seeds, you can also have seed swaps. And uh, the Gorge Telecom farmers have been having them for a few years now. Um, they're kind of like CD Saturdays, only we don't charge any money for the seeds. So it's just a straight swap, and um, some seeds are better than others. But we've lucked into quite a lot of really good growers in our neighborhood, and uh, it's a great way to uh, start your garden. And you can do it large or small. You can just do it over the fence with your neighbors or have an organized one like this. And there are the chickens, of course. Imagine trying to roll a plastic up a hoop house by yourself. You can soon see the, uh, the advantage of having community involved. <laughs> so that is what urban agriculture is to me. And um, I thought it would be interesting to look at some pictures of farms in cities. Um, 
this is one that you hear uh, a lot about whenever the press gets hold of um, the idea of urban agriculture and farms in cities. They always talk about these futuristic vertical farms. And um, I personally am a little uncomfortable with anybody in lab coats growing my food. <laughs> Um, and I just wonder if it's uh, the best use of available space and um, natural resources to start constructing big buildings like that. I don't know how long um, the vertical farms they're building now are intended to last, but I think I heard some shocking statistic um, a little while ago when somebody was just talking about a, um, I think it was a market building that I was visiting in England, and they said, of course, Buildings nowadays are only like built to last 35 years. Well, that's um, kind of a waste of lumber and steel and time and money. So that's one of my objections. Anyway. Um, some of you may have seen this or certainly heard about it in Vancouver. Um, I, I kind of like it because they're all growing on concrete just like me. <laughs> you do what you have to, I guess. I think the um, I think those uh, particular um, race beds are designed to be moved though. And then I also visited this uh, uh, edible garden project in Vancouver in North Van, and where they were actually uh, able to put in uh, an urban farm in a park, which I thought was a very useful public space. Um, I wanted to show you this because of this um, little structure in the bottom right. That's a bear-proof apiary. I'm planning to have bees there, but it's North Vancouver. But that was really cool. I hope it, uh, I hope it works. Um, and I, um, I took a bunch of pictures at the when I visited this particular place in London a couple of years ago. It's London, England, and um, I wanted to just show you because I thought it was um, so much fun. It's not really a working farm, but it's. Uh, it's a great concept for education. Um, this is in Dalston, which is in East London, kind of a down at heel area. I guess you can see there's a charity shop on one side and a nail shop on the other. <laughs> and then the um, council said that they um, would like to make better use of some of the storefronts there. So they had a competition to, uh, to come up with ideas for using shops. And so uh, an artist and a farmer got together and came up with the idea of having a farm in a shop. So they started uh, with, um, this is the front room. So the other side of this window here is so right up in front. <clears throat> they have an aquaponics um, project going. I think they were much inspired by Will Allen, who started uh, growing power in Milwaukee and uh, blew everybody's minds by starting to fish and greenhouses. You're going to be hearing from um, Mason Street Farm, I understand, later uh, in the series, so you'll probably hear a lot more about this concept. But um, basically what we got at the end of the room there, those blue things are um, fish tanks, and they got, I think they put yellow perch in. Uh, they were thinking of yellow perch or tilapia, or probably both, because those are um, pretty easy ones to grow in tanks. Um, the fish um, hang out there and then get harvested, but um, they leave certain waste products behind, which are then pumped into the neighboring tank under here. And the idea they had there was they were going to put some freshwater ponds in just to use the food production up a little bit more, and they would, um, they would eat some of that waste and pass the rest on to the plants that are growing in the tank above. Those are all growing hydroponically. And then it circulates behind us through pipes into the kind of cascading um, plant pots on the left and passes through all those root systems and gets cleaned and passed back into the fish tank. So um, they said, don't think of this as a um, front room or a bunch of pipes. Think of it as a stream because we're trying to replicate the stream here. So that was very nice. Upstairs, um, they have chickens. This is the chicken coop. And you can see it's uh, made of a, a very simple design and very low-tech materials. But it works perfectly well and the chickens are perfectly happy. 
they, next to that, they have a meeting room that they rent out for real extra income, and they have a basil wall at the end of the check out. It's very pretty. It's uh, also hydroponic, which has its own issues because you're actually growing in water, so you have to make some compromises about um, nourishing the plants. But it's, uh, it's a nice use of the wall space. Um, they had a bacteria wall, too, which I thought was just uh, fabulous. And, um, that's a, a map of London. That's the Thames running through it. And the little um, yellow splotches, I think, are places where they have um, spread the bacteria. And the bacteria they're talking about is actually um, kefir or kefir. So they were giving the grains to people and saying, you know, go and uh, multiply and pass it on, and we'll just try to keep track of it. So I thought that was kind of fun. <laughs> And they had a, a living wall in the hall of the and the stairwell as well. I think they were growing strawberries last time they visited. It's very pretty in there. And they had a polytunnel or a, a, a hoop house in the back. And they would have speakers and uh, workshops and things back there and parties. And they, they were building the wall as parties in the polytunnel. <laughs> the, where, behind where the guy is standing, um, there's a little strip of earth between the polytunnel and the wall. And so they were planning to bring from the farm some piglets and let them run back and forth and um, be composed and um, make a new one. I don't know if that happened or not. So that's, um, that's kind of it for my presentation. I'm trying to get a grip on social media. <laughs> Yeah, we started, um, I think it was 2008, um, and it started with three women who used to go for walks along the porch and talk about food security and our gardening, and um, they did that for a while, and they thought, you know what, um, there's probably other people who are interested in these things, wouldn't it be nice to find them? So they uh, put a notice in the community newsletter, and um, then people started to come. They, uh, when I when I came, I think there were about 20 people involved. There are now 115 households that are signed up members, um, and that just really means we're all on a mailing list. There's no uh, activity involved uh, other than come to meetings if you want to, um, which is uh, good and bad. The, the steering committee, of course, gets a little burnt out in that kind of situation, but. Uh, it's been um, really successful, and we have uh, meetings once a month, except in the summer. We stop uh, between, we have one in June, and then we don't have another one until September. And our September meeting will be a garden tour, so not really a big deal to organize. Um, and we have meetings about particular topics. The one last, Saturday, last Sunday was, um, one of our members is uh, formerly uh, massage therapist, so he gave us a little talk and, and a little um, demonstration on how to stay healthy in your garden. Some exercises and what it's ergonomic to move, stuff like that. And then we have the seed swap in January. Um, we have garden tours, which are, are just wonderful, um, because they're not usually show gardens. Um, some of them are astonishingly beautiful and productive, and others not so much, but you know, it's you can learn from everything. So. Uh, we, we really try to encourage everybody to offer their work. Um, and we have uh, started a seed bank. Um, Dan Jason from Salt Spring Seeds got up a, a, a little movement a couple of years ago, I think, um, just inviting communities to consider uh, establishing seed banks in, in a really simple way. So just like asking a couple of people to grow a certain kind of vegetable so that you can produce the seeds and have locally adapted um, food plants that you can then share around in times of crisis or just just to keep things going. So we have one of those. Um, and what else do we do? To say, um, we do uh, a few sort of 
projects together. We sometimes held workshops. We had a pruning workshop a couple years in, in a row. Um, I think we're going to go and try to tour uh, Gord Barrett's EcoSense house. Learn a bit more about how he's growing food in, in the islands. Um, yeah, it's it's um, served as a, a bit of a model. There are a couple other communities that are I don't, I don't know uh, what state their urban farming networks are at, but uh, it has been quite inspiring, I think, to some people. So I encourage everybody to start on Question. Um, what about the university and, and the colleges around here? Have they ever thought about offering an interactive course in this? Or? Uh, the question is, have um, colleges and universities uh, thought of Offering instructor like courses? Well, uh, just uh, basically introductory courses introductory during courses. agriculture uh, as part of continuing ed programs. You mean to um, learning how to grow food or just about uh, urban uh, Well, doing very much of what you're doing here and then going out, let's, let's go and discover what we, what, we, what we can actually do together. Mm -hmm. um, I think they pop up from time to time. Uh, I know Linda Gagey talked, uh, I think, a couple of courses at, at UVEC in Extension. And um, toward people around and show them various installations and things. Um, it kind of ebbs and flows. I'm not sure if there's anything for me. I just was reading today about um, the Earth program at Monson. It's about growing food. Um, I'm not sure if it's like a continuing education thing or whatever, but. Is it a. Is it a. You can grade it or is it community? I'm not sure. Um, it, it might be both. <laughs> <laughs> this is about the Earth's program at Coles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I um, I rent out my basement suite, and I had a student from Royal Roads who's doing the environmental management course there, um, staying with me in the fall, and she said they were doing a, um, a food project. Um, so they do a group project when they do their residencies there. So they um, they were setting up a herb garden or something for the person. So it's finding its way into all kinds of different areas. Mm -hmm. We needed to have at the university, so it was all that land. The uh, university has lots of stuff going on mm -hmm. um, with food. Uh, there was a, a whole battle raging last year, I think, over uh, uh, gorilla gardening. People were planting uh, beds okay. and the <laughs> staff were coming and tearing them up. <laughs> Yeah, my question is about your experience doing the masters um, in Italy, and I'm wondering how that um, may have impacted um, your experiences now um, in Victoria yeah. and, and how you approach urban agriculture. Yeah, what what I got was a masters in food culture and communication, and um, uh, I think if you sort of looked at what they were trying to teach us, in some ways. Um, kind of separate, but um, I think food production becomes so central once you know what's happened to the industrial food system, you just don't really want to eat that stuff anymore. So it really did um, trigger the change for me, I think, because I came back from Italy and I just, I would go to restaurants and I'd look at the menu and think, well, I can't eat this. <laughs> I can tell you everything on the menu, why I shouldn't be eating it. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it was a moral objection, and sometimes it was a chemical one. You know, it really uh, kind of threw me for a while. So I did go in search of better food, and that was how I ended up um, both with the Gorge Hill Urban Farmers, because I saw that and I was saying, does anyone want to get together and talk about food security? I wasn't quite sure what food security was, but um, it seemed to be within what I was looking for, and it did turn out to be incredibly helpful and rewarding. And then um, it also led me to Halbert Farm. Um, I just happened upon a notice saying that they had work parties on the farm. And one of my classmates had uh, done an internship partly on an organic farm, and she kind of, kind of came back to the class saying, oh, well, I'm sure there's a lot of work growing organic food. So I was curious about what she was talking about. And uh, I, I agree with her. Uh, it's worth it. <laughs> so. Um, that, um, that 
volunteer stint at Halliburton Farm hasn't actually ended. I've been worked on to the board now, so apparently I can never leave. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's great to go out and actually farm with people who know what they're doing. So I found those work parties incredibly uh, educational. And also, I just thought the people were so great because they, they were really dedicated to this whole idea of producing wonderful food with no chemicals and, um, and teaching people about it. The farm has an educational mandate as well, so um, that led me to that. And then I just stumbled across the um, notice about uh, St. Lawrence College. They just started a Sustainable Local Food for Canadians certificate program through their continuing studies. Um, online um, faculty department. And uh, so I just um, contacted them to see if there was anything I could be involved with. Um, and they were still setting up courses, so I set up on urban agriculture because I thought it would be a great thing to know more about. So, so that's my kind of byword. If you don't know something, um, teach a course on it. <laughs> What are some of the occupations that have been involved with the Halliburton, uh, with the, sorry, the, the Gorge? What are the occupations of the people yeah. the, on, on the Gorge Yeah, I'm interested in knowing the, kind of like the work schedules and the backgrounds, like are these people which work in blogs that are pretty busy, like who's taking the time out of the day to, to join this? Um, it's, uh, it's everything and anything. Um, there are some retired people, some self-employed people, um, some stay-at-home parents. Um, uh, really, it's it, there's very little effort involved. We have um, one steering committee meeting a month um, where, where we just get together and talk about what we might do at the next meeting and what kind of long-term plans we might have. Um, and then a monthly meeting, a couple of hours. So, not, there's kind of as little or as much as you want to put into it, like most volunteers. Um, we don't have a membership fee, and we don't, so we don't have that sort of full financial structure that might take a bit more time. And we don't have any kind of legal status, so we don't have to um, have auditors or, or bankers or official people. We just need an community center and take donations to for our rent. <laughs> And our seed bank um, uh, is held in a couple of people's freezers and our sheds. We don't need to have infrastructure. We do have a library and a community center very kind of stores that for us. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I never introduced myself to start. I'm on the chair of the front of NRG. So as Rona mentioned, we have Frederick University next Tuesday with the folks from the Mason Street Farm who are going to talk about aquaponics, which is something that's way over my head, but it sounds really interesting. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah.